Hey everyone, I'm Jesse Sparks, host of the new podcast, The One Recipe, from the team behind The Splendid Table. This pod is all about that one recipe that you lean on. The one you share with friends, the one you make when you need a little love, and the one you know will work every single time. Every week, I talk with chefs and gifted cooks from all over the world about their one and the story behind it. We're here to help you build your kitchen library one dish at a time. Follow The One Recipe wherever you get your podcasts. On the dining room table were things like collard greens, cornbread, sweet potato pie, liver and onions with gravy, and chicken dumplings, or as my nana called it, chicken and pastry, where she rolled out long strips of dough on brown paper bags with a glass. And to this day, I haven't found a better dish. All of these meals and more were in regular rotation on the dinner table, and it was what I ate every day. One of my fondest childhood memories is coming home from school to find out what my Nana cooked for dinner. She was an excellent cook, never measured anything. And yet, I put her dishes up against practically any award-winning restaurant in the country. Clearly, I got my love of food from her. And I suppose it was only natural that I started digging into not only what we eat, but why we eat it. Welcome to Saying the Table, a podcast about Black cuisine and food ways. I'm Deb Freeman. I'm a writer that focuses on African-American food ways and the impact those food ways have on how we cook and eat today. On this episode, we're taking a look at the complicated relationships some Black chefs have with soul food, which has become interchangeable with Black food. We'll talk to three chefs who have made their careers cooking, advancing, and thinking about the history and future of soul food. So first, let's talk about exactly what is soul food. And to talk about that, I went to the most knowledgeable person I know. My name is Therese Nelson, Harlem-based chef, writer, and the founder of the website BlackConeHistory.com. Therese is a chef, author, and a living encyclopedia of Black culinary history. And I couldn't think of anyone better to give us an overview of what soul food is. She is always so generous with her knowledge. And she's just really a cool person. 2015, Austin, Texas, 150th anniversary of emancipation. Lola's Eric Eli is up on a podium in a room full of the smartest, dopest, most wide-ranging Black food creators in the country. And he comes at the tail end of a three-day conference that Tony Tipton Martin has convened. But we're all thinking about what it means to be Black in food. So he stands up in front of this group of people and he gives this definition for soul food. And he basically says that it is the food of Black people descended from the African diaspora. He says it's a collection of ingredients, techniques, all telling a similar story. But for me, the way in which he framed soul food really should have been what is Black food. I think soul food is a very convenient container that's legible to people. It talks about time, place, terroir. It gives people a very clear set of dishes or a starting point for thinking about what the food of the Black experience is in this country. It's not the whole story. It's not even the most interesting story. But it's a clear and legible story. I've been sitting with his definition since 15 because he was trying to get the heart of how you put words to something that has such a particular kind of ephemera tied to it, has such a particular kind of emotional connection to it, and something that is different region to region. So I guess the short answer is soul food is Black food. The longer, more complicated and nuanced answer is that soul food is whatever you want it to be, but it's a starting point. Soul food can also feel like a burden that Black chefs have to carry. I asked Therese to share her thoughts on that complicated relationship. I think about Red Man Grows a lot. There's this really dope interview of her where she's talking to somebody in maybe, feels like the mid to late 90s. And this woman is asking her a very well-intentioned question about sort of why she doesn't like soul food because she had been famously quoted as saying she had a problem with using soul food as sort of a container for Black food and culture. Vernon McGrosner, famed 
culinary anthropologist kind of created that language around culinary anthropology. And what Dr. Grossman says in that interview is basically that soul food is a very particular kind of translation of Black culture that existed in a very particular time and that its function is of that time. That said, I always think about soul food as immigrant cuisine, as movement cuisine, as sort of trying to translate and find place and find home and personhood outside the context of the protection of the American South. Think about the second wave of the Great Migration. Think about the civil rights era when this sort of language of soul, soul music, soul cuisine, soul culture is birthed itself in terms of language. That time period is all about people exiting the South, exiting the past in this really particular way. It was this idea of forward thinking, forward movement. And so I think soul food was also less about particular dishes and more about this new way of thinking about Blackness. Soul food was coined in the 60s during the civil rights era to represent the heritage cuisines that African Americans preserved through the Great Migration. It's a cuisine with roots in West African and European foodways, a mix made possible because of Black enslavement. And many of the dishes have blended into Southern cuisine at large. I think the legacy of soul food is always going to be about Black agency and Black placemaking. I love the idea of soul food. Renee Mae was a little concerned with soul food, but she wasn't concerned with it because she didn't respect it. She was concerned with it because there's a tendency to rest on heritage as though it's a static thing. It's a comfortable thing to rest on heritage because it doesn't suggest that you have to contribute anything. That's not what our culture is ever about. When we show up fully as Black people, we create the culture, we create the conversation. But you can't do that work without being informed. The legacy of most of the folks, especially in the midst of the civil rights era, the soul generation, so much of their legacy, so much of that work was about creating a new language. We are existing in a similar moment. We exist in a moment where we are in a profoundly kinetic, artistic moment. Black art and music is on fire. Should we not be as full with thinking about our food? That, to me, does not look like just resting on the tropes of the past. I mean, (laughs) start thinking forward. Soul food is about innovation. I mean, we could sort of lament the static nature of the tropes of soul food and the, you know, celebration foods that we rest on, but that's not the whole story. We know it. So tell a more expansive story. That's the job. That's the gig. But like Therese says, soul food shouldn't be confined to stereotypes because it was never meant to be a limiting constraint, but rather a very broad description of Black food. So how can we redefine soul food for the modern era? The work of a real chef is translation, is starting from a place of your particular point of view, your particular place in the world, the set of experiences, cultural references, technical ability, all of that is put into a pot. And you start from that place to express, to translate what you think about food. Why is that different for Black chefs? Why is that not the work that you're supposed to be doing? To cite inspiration, cite reference is necessary. But your work shouldn't be trying to recreate a modern version of the soul food restaurants that exist. Your work should be taking the same influences, tasting those flavors, Deciding what you want to say as a professional chef and creating your own language. Of course, there's going to be growing pains. Of course, it's going to be messy. Of course, it's going to be complicated. But I think the fruit of that labor exists in the form of really dope restaurants from all over the diaspora. Restaurants that aren't beholden to the narrowness of anyone else's expectations, but are really asking interesting questions about how you move cuisine forward are thriving right now. Like, to be a Black chef right now in this moment, the work is so dope, so delicious. It's really asking folks about how they want to dine and what's delicious. It's fusion between communities. You exist in a place where your food is in cultural context to all kinds of other influences, and it's showing up on a plate in a way that I think is more soulful than anything else. Maybe it's not traditional, but soulful restaurants have always been in community with other cultures. So why is that not 
the part of the legacy we want to talk about or pay attention to. I wanted to explore more about the modern chefs who have made cooking soul food their calling. That meant I needed to talk to Chef Chris Scott. My name is Chris Scott, and I'm a chef here in New York City, and I'm calling from uh, my restaurant, Butterfunk Biscuit Company. Chris is an amazing chef who's had a long and storied career cooking up some really good food. You might remember Chris from his deep run on season 15 of Top Chef, where he famously called his style of cooking Amish soul food. I've been a massive fan of his for a while, and he's one of the best people I know to talk to about Black food. You know, Amish soul food to me is regular food. You know, it's it's certainly what I grew up on. The best way to describe it, my family is originally from Virginia. And during the Great Migration North, they relocated to an area called Coatesville, Pennsylvania, which is smack dab in between Philly and Lancaster County, more leaning towards Lancaster County. So they started to co-mingle with some of the Amish folk and the Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, the German, the Dutch cuisine that they have. It was sort of like the best of both worlds came together. You know, you have Southern food from Virginia, that Tidewater kind of feel. And now here they are, you know, a couple hundred miles north in Coatesville, intermingled, you know, with a new style of cuisine and what was happening in the area. So by the time that I was born, that stuff was already on the table. To me, it seemed completely normal. I just happened to coin that phrase when I was on the show. And I guess because no one said it before, it sort of became a thing. It's plain and simple. It's the food that me and my family were raised on. Chris believes that food should tell a story. And that belief also informs his approach to soul food. Soul food is, it's our story. It's the joy and pain. It's a lot of things that go deeper than just what's right in front of your face. Much deeper than what anyone or any of us can put on the plate. Soul food is regional, first off. So, like, even down south, you have some of the the low country or you have the Creole or what's happening between the, the Florida panhandle all the way to Texas. And then you start moving your way up into the Tidewater, different regions there. And then you go a little bit west from there, it's more barbecue-ish. Then you come find your way up to the north, where more ingredients kind of came into play, like sugar and cream and butter, where people or folks could afford to have some money, some money to put that into the food. But I think that when you look at the regions of Southern cuisine, that tells the story. It's a way of life. It tells our story through the food, all the way from the women that fried chicken and sold it to the travelers on the train, all the way from the bakers that did the cornbread, the flatbreads, the biscuits, and then to take it even deeper, the roti, the injera, things of that nature, because it has so many left and right turns, it's not always directly straight. To me, soul food is more of our story. It's our way of life. We just communicate that through our food. So having that opportunity to tell that story about my youth and this food, that's everything. To me, it's always about giving back and telling the origins of who we are and as individuals, because every single Black person has their own, of course, soul food story, but their Black family story too, you know. And there are similarities in that, but also a lot of different things too. So this kind of gives you a lot of insight to me, to where I'm from, to who raised me, to these two women that raised me, to how we ate, and so on and so on. Just like with my Nana, Chris's grandmother plays a big role in his story. And I asked him to share some of his memories of her. Nana always had a green thumb. She would grow anything from like rhubarb to tomatoes. She even tried her hand at a Japanese peach tree that she planted in the backyard one time, but the worms and the birds got to that. But almost every single thing that she would grow, she would use in the house, either for salads or or for canning or just to 
to throw together real fast from squash to pies to like she was so creative like that right next door was a lady her name was uh mrs mitchum and she grew concord grapes they would trade off they would lift a bag over the backyard fence and nana would can some of her concord grapes and and then the lady next door would maybe can some uh, tomatoes or so but nana always had a green thumb and she was always very conscious about what was happening in the garden with the climate she knew when to pick when not to pick uh when to water when she could get the best use of a tomato or a cucumber or whatever it is that she was growing to pickle it and even knowing when to bust that out either make it like a chow chow or or something sweet and sour and she was handy like that i wanted to get chris's thoughts on what teresa mentioned about the stag nature of how soul food is perceived versus the dynamic nature of what soul food can be i love the fact that there are southern chefs that stay true to what our ancestors ate because i think that that's important i think that It's great to taste those flavors to still master those techniques because a lot of people will look at soul food and they'll go, "Oh man, that's the easiest food ever. You just dump something in the fryer or you add a bunch of fat or whatever." There was a lot of of technique in that style. It is a lot of technique in that style which people just disregard and sideline. I think that soul food purists that still cook that way, it's it's brilliant. But there is a great number of us who are rooted in that like myself who are changing it a little bit at a time. I will probably never go like way off the deep end, but sometimes I like to have one foot in and one foot out. Just yesterday I was doing a cornbread recipe where rather than make the recipe all in one shot, I make a cornmeal sponge. So I take some sourdough starter, I add a little bit more buttermilk to that. and then the cornmeal and just let that sit for about 48 hours. When you come in the next day, the fermentation process really gets, you know, you really taste that that sourdough funk, but it's not too much. And then I add goat milk to that. Goat milk and buttermilk. Proceed with the, you know, the eggs, the sugar, this and that and then you bake it. The texture of it was super moist. You know how when you have good buttermilk and you get that tang, picture that times 5 with a little bit of the honey butter in there, a little bit of sea salt. I'm telling you this <laughs> as going to be my new joint now. So every single time I do cornbread, I think that this new way that I've been experimenting with is the way that I'm going to do it. But that's but that's what I mean. Like it's still rooted in culture. It's still rooted an ingredient focused stuff. All I did was tweak a few things here and there to really elevate the science of it. That sourdough sounds amazing, and I'm going to need that recipe ASAP. But before saying goodbye to Chris, I want to get his thoughts on how he thinks soul food can move onward and upward as a modern cuisine. You know what I would like to see for real? So you know how a lot of chefs will always travel around and they'll go from from place to place and they'll try to stage at different restaurants in different parts of the world like for example you'll go and you'll have a guy who wants to do a stage at per se and then once he's done at per se they'll send him to chicago and he'll work with charlie trotter once he's done you know at charlie trotter he'll send him you know to some other chef what i want to see is chefs taking an interest in black food and coming and doing a stage in our restaurants like knowing what a ham hock is and how to really use it what does it do in our food knowing about collard greens knowing about chow chows knowing about you know Haitian pickles and pickles in general or or any of the breads that we do i would like to see people of all races doing stages in black food focused restaurants and then i think from there that they'll be able to kind of branch out and do their own thing and and then i think that you'll see more of a change in the way that soul food is if they're true to it and keep like i do keep one foot in 
you know, maybe one foot out every now and then. I think that there's so many possibilities to what soul food could even look like in 10, 15 years from now. I would like to see that happen first to where people would take an interest in doing a stash at the Red Rooster, coming here and learning breads made from brown countries, you know, learning all of that stuff. I absolutely love this idea of staging at Black restaurants and then taking that knowledge to the next level. If any chefs are listening, y'all should make that happen. Our last guest for this episode is another prominent chef who's on the cutting edge of modern soul food. My name is Mashama Bailey, and I am a chef, and I'm calling from Austin, Texas. Mashama is a James Beard award-winning chef and is the co-owner of The Gray in Savannah, Georgia, one of the top restaurants in the nation. The restaurant just happens to be a formerly segregated Greyhound bus terminal. Talk about juxtaposition. I was excited to catch Mashama while she was in Austin, Texas, where she's opening two new restaurants this year. Like with Teresa and Chris, I wanted to get her thoughts on the term soul food. I think I'm a little ambivalent. You know, I love the word soul. I love food. I think saying those two things make perfect sense to me. And I know when I say those two words together that I'm talking about my particular experience. I'm not necessarily talking about what soul food has been conveyed as out in the world or in the media. From a personal perspective, I don't think it's outdated, but I do think from, you know, a media perspective, I can see how some people would say that it's just a blanket, it's outdated, and it just needs to go away, especially as more and more Black chefs arise to a position of influence. I think that it seems small now. It doesn't give us our full due. Michelle's cooking is a reflection of her own life's journey, having cooked in restaurants from New York City to Burgundy, France, to Savannah, Georgia, and now in Austin. Michelle shared some of her thoughts about her cooking and how she ended up cooking her style of food. My cooking is all over the place. Like, I feel like I got a real, you know, I grew up in New York City, heavily influenced by New York City delis and bodegas. I'm also influenced by Korea and China and Italy and France. And so when I was growing up and I wanted to cook food professionally, I wasn't very interested in learning how to cook soul food. I was interested in learning how to cook everything else. Not because I cooked soul food particularly well, but because I was interested in all types of food. And so I think for me, because I was very interested in learning how to cook from a European point of view, because I think I liked the structure of it and I liked the record keeping of it. I liked the recipes of it and the techniques. I kind of went that route, but it wasn't until I opened up a restaurant that I was like, girl, you need to look into the things that are really going to make your food different and special. Because it wasn't until I opened The Gray was when I really started to think about what I was trying to say and who I was there to represent. And that's when I started to look at the things that were going to keep me grounded and that kept me motivated. I remember when I started cooking, my grandmother, she would just say, oh, well, you have to be careful about what you put in your belly and you can't go out eating all that stuff, she would say. If I went to like go eat oysters with friends or if I had like beef tartare or something like that, she'd be like, oh, you can't put all that stuff in your stomach. You have to protect your stomach. You have to kind of eat the food that we've been raised on is what she was implying. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like this is a whole different thing and I'm learning so much and I'm learning about French food and I'm learning about Italian food and I'm learning about Spanish food. It's fine because that food has its own history too. And it wasn't until I opened up the gray when it was like, I want to cook the food that nourishes me and that I find nourishing and that I found comforting and craveable. And that's when I made the connection to what she was saying. And I think that that's when my food started to take a turn for the better. Mashama's experiences culminated into a unique spin on food that served at the gray. I guess if I were to put 
a phrase to it, it would be Port City Southern by way of the African diaspora, right? So it's like there is like this kind of nod to West Africa, definitely a nod to Black Americans or Blacks in the South, a nod to servitude, to Blacks in the homes of rich people cooking, those types of foods. And maybe that's where the French techniques or the Spanish techniques make sense in Black kitchens because we kind of do a little bit of that crossover. And how did the Diaries of Savannah take to Mashama's Port City Southern food? I think it was mostly positive. I don't think everything was really relatable. We were far more rustic in the beginning, doing pork shanks and greens with cornbread and grilled steaks. My maternal grandmother worked in a daycare for many, many years, and she was by far one of the best cooks in the family that I can remember. But I would visit her in Georgia. She would always have something on the stove, and often she would make a, a pasta, spaghetti, with ground beef, tomato, and cheddar cheese. <laughs> I don't know if anybody out there knows what that is, but I often ate that in the summertime when we would go and visit her. It was a good pot of food. And so when I came to Savannah talking to my Italian business partner, I was like, we got to do a pasta like that. And I think he almost fell over. And so I figured out a way to do my own take on what would be a country pasta, which is basically like a play on carbonara with a braised pork belly and egg yolks and black pepper. So that was on the opening menu. We did like a sizzly pig, a lot of pork on the opening menu, actually. <laughs> Some whole grilled fish. And people were into that. Some people were looking for fried chicken, and I kind of kept that at bay for as long as I could. People were looking for shrimp and grits, and I kept that at bay. And I think now that I'm a little bit more comfortable in my voice, I don't mind bringing those things into my repertoire. But I think in the beginning, I didn't want to be defined by people's expectations of what they thought I was going to be cooking. I wanted to cook stuff that was really a little bit different, a little bit closer to why I got into food. Like Chris, Mashama is interested in pushing the boundaries of what soul food can mean by utilizing the many skills and techniques she has learned throughout her career. I think we're probably cooking more from our own personal experience, not from what people are looking from us. I think, you know, we're, we're traveling more. We have way more exposure. We're like moving away from where we were raised and going away to schools and coming back or going across this water, the country, going to Africa. We're seeing way more things firsthand. And I think that that level of exposure is influencing our foods. And so I think that we still are coming from authentic places that are Black and beautiful, but we're also seeing more. So by us seeing more, that also, we're artists, you know, we're creative. So that's going to play in how we're even preparing something. Like even if we fry fish, we're probably going to use a method that we prefer. If it's going to be lighter, then maybe we're frying fish in a more Korean way or a more Japanese way or a more Scandinavian way versus how we may have learned to do it growing up from our grandmothers or growing up from the neighborhood chicken and waffle spot. Maybe we're doing it just a little bit differently so we can incorporate more flavor, we can have more crunch, we can have more texture. I think that's how we're elevating our perspectives in food. And I think that has a lot to do with me. Like I've been exposed to a lot. So that comes back to show in my food. And so I experiment and I change dishes and I create from that place because my food was very different, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, last year. I asked Mashama if the term soul food is outdated and if there's even a place for it today. Can we just be Black and cooking or can't we just be chefs? <laughs> can't we just be good at what we do? You know, like, because we always have to be excellent. We always have to be labeled and there always has to be something that is attached to what we do so people know that we are Black Americans living in this country doing extraordinary things. But can't we just be extraordinary people in this country doing extraordinary things? And so... I don't know. Like, I don't really care. I use the word because I was born in the 70s and my parents, it's just in me. So I'm going to forever use that word. But like, if my nephew never says soul food, it wouldn't bother me. Like, I would not miss it coming out of his mouth. So I don't know. I don't think it defines us. I just think that we're above and beyond it. And I think that there was a time and place for it. And I think that, you know, we've been through a lot, you know, and we have to show ourselves love in so many different ways. And I think that soul food was definitely a way that we showed ourselves love. And I think as long as it's continued to be used in that way, then I'm for it. But as soon as it starts to feel like it's being exploited, then I'm not for it. This has been Setting the Table. I'd like to thank my guests, Therese Nelson, Chris Scott, and Mashama Bailey. Check out Therese's work preserving the culinary history of Black food at blackculinaryhistory.com. Next time you're in New York City, check out Chris's restaurant, Butterfunk Biscuit Company, located in Harlem, 
and be on the lookout for his upcoming cookbook, Homage, Recipes and Stories from an Amish Soul Food Kitchen. And if you get the chance, definitely pay a visit to one of Mashama's restaurants, the Gray in Savannah, the Gray Diner Bar in Austin, and the Gray Market in both Savannah and Austin. Her cookbook slash memoir, Black, White, and the Gray, co-written with the Gray co-owner, John O. Morisamo, is available now at booksellers everywhere. Saying the Table is part of Whetstone Radio Collective. Thank you to the Setting the Table team, producer Marvin Ya, audio editor Evan Lindsay, researcher Havan Obasilase, and intern Kai Stone. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder Stephen Satterfield, Whetstone Radio Collective head of podcasts, Celine Glazier, sound engineer, Max Katelchuk, associate producer, Quentin LeBeau, production assistant, Amalisa Utinko, and sound intern, Simon Lavender. Cover art created by Whetstone art director, Alexandra Bowman. Our theme music is Who's Back in Town by Sammy Miller and the Congregation. You can learn more about this podcast at whetstoneradio.com, on Instagram and Twitter at Whetstone Radio, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Whetstone Radio Collective, for more podcast video content. You can learn more about all things happening at Whetstone at whetstonemagazine.com. Until next time, I'm Deb Freeman.